So I'll screen share. I'll screen, I'll share uh, the monitor that I got here. In this case, it's this one. Let me know if you guys can see that. Yeah, I can see it okay. Perfect. All right. So, again, thanks for coming out, guys. I'm pretty excited about this topic. Again, it's one of my favorite topics, uh, cryptography. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's pretty it's pretty wild. It covers a lot of bases. It covers encryption. It covers ciphers. It covers steganography. Um, it covers even like text encoding, which is a pretty, uh, uh, a lot of programmers will deal with uh, text encodings throughout their career. So that's a really interesting thing as well. Um, so basically, uh, of the 10 main skill categories, we'll be talking. We'll be talking about uh, cryptography today. That's the second one on this list. Um, and again, just like what I said, that's what we'll be covering. So uh, what is cryptography? In my words, it's the practice of making things secret. <laughs> or in other words, hiding messages in a way that make the original message unrecognizable. So it's cryptic, right? It's being cryptic with your messages. Um, it's super important to have cryptography uh, in the case of secure communications. It was critical during World War II. Um, the Germans had this device called the Enigma machine, which would basically encrypt their messages in a pseudo-random way to where the Enigma machine itself was configured uh, pre-configured in a certain way so that the messages would spit out and then they would uh, on the other end those messages uh, or on the other end of the the receiving end of those messages they would configure their enigma sh machine to the same as the other enigma machine and then they'd be able to uh, decrypt that message so it was actually crazy and uh, the British the, the US uh, the allied forces they couldn't figure out how to crack the the Germans code like it was just insane and, it, and this so they called it enigma um, and it wasn't until I think there's a movie made about it um, I can't remember what it's called but it's a more recent movie all about how he broke the code and I, yeah imitation game that's what it is and so that's if you ever want to look into that a little more and look at how we used to break <laughs> encryptions because the way he did it was through math and by hand and all that stuff and it was just crazy man so that's kind of a, another taste of how encryption and cryptography is applied um, so yeah it's been used for thousands of years back in the Roman days uh, Caesar the Emperor he is a pretty pretty clever guy he came up with the Caesar cipher um, and it was just a way of scrambling the words in his messages so if, if he ever wanted to like give a message um, but it was important and he didn't want didn't want anyone to know what it said except for the intended person he would use his Caesar cipher so he, he implemented uh, a shift cipher uh, rotation ciphers and substitution ciphers with the Caesar cipher so there's multiple variations of it and we're actually going to go over that at some point today. So um, what I wanted to do is just go well, a little detour here. I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of the, the Cicada 3301. I don't even know what to call it, like a challenge, not, not really a challenge. It's kind of like this weird, I've heard people call it an augmented reality game, but it's one of my favorite real world examples of modern cryptography. So back in uh, in 2012, actually, you know what? Hang on one second. I'm going to pull up the website because this website goes over it so well. So I'll pull that up. So back in 2012 uh, on 4chan, this image that you see right here just randomly appeared. I think it was January 5th, 2012, like at midnight or something like that. And as you can see, the message just says, hello, we are looking for highly intelligent individuals. To find them, we have devised a test. There is a message hidden in this image. 
find it and it will lead you on the road to finding us. We look forward to meeting the few that make it all the way through. Good luck, 3301. So like that came out, people are like, yeah, that's funny because 4chan is just this like cess cesspool of like random crap and most of it's just trolls. But then some people tried to check it out and it turns out that, yeah, there is hidden stuff inside this image. So if you actually, because you can still download the image, like this website right here will provide it. You can download the original, uh, the original invitation and actually play around with it. So in this case, I'm going to show you. So if we go, this is on Kali Linux. If you guys aren't familiar with Kali Linux, open up the terminal. And we're just going to use the basic strings command on this. And it spits out anything that it recognizes as strings inside the image. In this case, we can see at the very beginning, there's the header that represents it's a JPEG. I think it's a JPEG. Yeah, it's a JPEG image. And then there's some comments up here. I think these are just red herrings. I don't know if they actually mean anything specifically, but if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's this. So it says, well, I can't read that part, but Clandivus Caesar says this right here. So in this case, it was a hint. Caesar hinted that this was a Caesar cipher on this text. Um, and I also want you guys to note what I did here with the terminal, because if you're using a Linux distro, oh yeah, for sure, I can definitely uh, do like a 15 minute rundown of how to install and use uh, Kali Linux. It's definitely my favorite distro when it comes to hacking. Um, and yeah, I think it is critical to have something like this on your system if you're gonna do hacking at some point. So yeah, uh, on a Linux distro, most systems come with the, the terminal. If it doesn't pop up on the drop down here, you could just typically go um, up in the bar there and type in terminal and something in here will come up. Kali Linux comes with like a million different versions of it, which is pretty sick. But so anyways, type in strings and it'll, it'll spit out um, anything that's a recognizable string in there. You could, if you're feeling crazy, you could do something like hex dump uh, and dash capital C spits it, uh, will, will parse through the hexadecimal and, and spit out anything as a, uh, as characters that can be seen as characters. So this is kind of probably something I would end up doing is just doing a hex dump, um, recognizing the hex as characters and then do tail just to see the last like 250 characters of it. And you get the same idea, but eventually... I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm sure we'll all practice a little bit with like hex dump and stuff like that. There's also, I think there's hex edit. Yeah, hex edit's another way to parse through the binary of a file. But my point is, <laughs> I'm definitely getting a little bit sidetracked here. Um, we'll go over that in a bit. So turns out there was a message hidden inside this image. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much exactly what I just did. Uh, if you convert it and you decode, it spits out um, a URL. And so if you go to the URL, it gave you this image. And people were stuck on this because people in 4chan, they were like looking at all this stuff and they were like, wow, that's actually pretty crazy that there's a picture in there or that there's a URL. And then they went to the URL and there was an image and everyone's like, Man, so I wonder if there's any hints in this part too. So a community started forming of individuals who were working on like solving this thing together and they would talk to each other about it and they would share. So anytime like an, uh, something got solved, they would all start working on the next challenge together. And in this case, this was one of them and they got stuck on this for like weeks because they didn't really understand where they were supposed to go from here. They did the strings thing on this, the hex dump thing on this. They did all kinds of stuff like looking through the uh, the uh, least significant bit of every single um, pixel of the image to see if there was something hidden inside that. But in this case, there was still nothing. Um, some clever dude somewhere realized that there's a program. So, that, so you read this, it goes, whoops, just decoys this way. Looks like you can't guess how to get this, get the image out. Now it's kind of weird, it's worded funny, right? Some clever dude who had just the right, like, 
knowledge of cryptography realized that there's a program called OutGuess and he used this image on OutGuess and it spat out this. So this is just this big, in this case I think it's a, it's just like a string of, okay, it's book code. To find the book and more information, you go to Reddit. So it gives you a Reddit link as well. And uh, they, I think the Reddit page is still up actually. Yeah, so it's still right here. And this is the last post uh, for that year's challenges. So it spits out all these, these, uh, these, I guess it's just like a digit with a colon and a digit, but it turns out that what that does is it gives you a string of like, <laughs> it's so complicated. I knew I was going to butcher this, but if you go through like, this is the like page number and then like, or I think it's, this is the paragraph number and then this is the character and it assembles a message out of all of that. But no one could figure this out for a while. They just tried to figure out this Reddit page. And when you go to the Reddit page, there was these Mayan numerals that were set as the title for it. It's no longer like that anymore because it's, uh, it's like that was way back in 2012 and Reddit's changed a lot since then. But you decrypt the Mayan numerals, all that kind of stuff. There was more images all throughout this, uh, this Reddit page. There's just all this like uh, encrypted cipher text here. Um, and then if you use outguess on this image right here, the welcome image, which you can see, I think it's, yeah, it's not that one. Honestly, maybe it's not on this, this one. I can't even remember where they found this, but they found it in there. So it, they, they found a PGP signed message in here. And this was pretty important that they found this P, uh, PGP message because this public key is Cicada 3301's main public key. Um, so they use they used all that and they continued to like work through it. And I'm not gonna get too in detail about it because this whole puzzle, this was just 2012's puzzle. This whole puzzle was like, it lasted them a couple months just trying to solve it. And slowly as they went along solving these cryptic messages and tools, they finally got to a point where uh, only a few people were left. Um, and then they, they each individually got contacted by Cicada 3301 and were organized into a group. And from there, we don't really know what officially happened. It's There's rumors and there's people that say they have proof and stuff like that, but it's, it's, it's con conjecture at that point because anyone could say that they got inducted, right? Uh, another really interesting thing is that like eventually all those things from the Reddit page and all that led to um, this phone call. So there was a phone number that was in there. And if you hit play, you, probably, you might not be able to hear that. So in case you didn't hear that, this phone call refers to that original image, uh, this one right here. So it turns out that the prime numbers they were talking about were the dimensions of the picture. If you multiply those dimensions together, it gets you a website. And uh, the website that it brought you to, it's no longer up anymore because this is ancient history now, but the website had a countdown that was just going. I think it was like a week, like it was just a countdown for a week from that date. And then eventually when that countdown hit zero, like everyone was on the edge of their seats and these GPS coordinates popped up on the webpage and they were all across the world, man. Like there was one in Japan, there was one in Australia, there was like two in the States, there was one in Europe, like it was nuts. So people that were nearby managed to go to a couple of them and at the site there was like 
this piece of paper taped up to the a pole with the Cicada logo and a QR code. The people who scanned the QR code got one of these messages. And I think that they're, they're book codes again. Um, yeah, they're all book codes. They all had the same book code, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then from there, it led on to the deep web, and you had to so solve puzzles on the deep web. Um, I think you also had to do some uh, some PGP key <laughs> like math solving, which is one thing that we did in the last uh, NCL Cyber Skyline challenge. So my point is, is this puzzle was long and extremely complicated and like required a really intense skill set of cryptography knowledge and by the end of it no one even heard from who solved it because the people who solved it went totally dark so they did that in 2012 and then another one happened in 2013 so someone messaged uh that I guess Cicada 331 posted another one in 2013 and that one was like eight like I want to say that the the difficulty level of 2012 is like x but then the uh the difficulty level in 2013 was like five times x like it was orders of magnitude more difficult and then in 2014 it came out again with another challenge because people from 2013 solved the, the, uh, that challenge. And in 2014, they came up with another challenge. This one was like just as intense and just as complicated as the 2013 one. But this time, um, all of the deep web pages that uh, the challenge led to um, created like this book. And it's hard for me to describe exactly what the book was, but it's called the... Uh, Hang on a second. It's called the Liber Primus. So it's like, or Primus, I think. But like, it's this super cryptic book with, that's written in freaking runic, man. Like that's a, a super ancient language that is beyond dead. Like we barely know what runic is. And so they wrote this book in runic and it like translates to all kinds of things. And the thing, the, the reason why Cicada did uh, a challenge after 2012 is because they solved the 2012 one. And then they did a challenge after 2013 because they solved the 2013 one. But they haven't done a challenge since 2014 because nobody's solved this, this, uh, this Liber Primus book. Primus, I don't know. I'm butchering that, but... My point is, is like, this is my favorite cryptology story of all time because it is the weirdest and like deepest rabbit hole you can possibly go into that doesn't involve anything like gross and and like illegal. <laughs> as far as I know, and like you have to be familiar with all kinds of the weirdest books to even like grasp what these books are or what this... Liber Primus is talking about. So anyways, that's a big tangent. Um, but it's an example of a real world uh, cryptography challenge. Anyways, so if you guys want to check it out, if you want to look at the, all these things, which I highly recommend if you're at all interested in cryptography, uh, check out these links that I'll, I'll post in the slides. So cryptography in ethical hacking. Now we're going to get down to the brass tacks of this. Um, typically, cryptography and ethical hacking involves ciphers, encryption, uh, encoding, and steganography as just kind of four um, major categories. So ciphers is, is typically done, like it used to be done by hand, but now we have computers to speed up the process. Encryption is, uh, is running algorithms on a message to spit out like totally unrecognizable data. Encoding is taking plain text and transferring it to a different um, binary order, I guess you could call it, just so that it can be used uh, for data transmission. Like if you're like emails, right? Like they'll typically encode uh, plain text into a different encoding to send through an email. 
um, like in the email packets across the network. And then you got your steganography and that's, that's my favorite stuff. Steganography, you know, hiding stuff in images, hiding images and images, hiding zip files and images. Um, and we'll talk about all that. So ciphers, um, I think it's really important to point out the most common ciphers. You've got your Caesar cipher, which we mentioned earlier, Alberti's disc, which you can kind of see right here. And if, you know, if you just look at that intuitively, you can kind of figure out that like, um, you know, if you move the disc, this inner disc around, whatever letter is on the message would actually translate to whatever letter is on the inner disc. So that's kind of how the, the disc works. There's Vigneer, there's pig pen cipher. That's this one right here. If you guys have ever done escape rooms, one of my other favorite things to do, um, there, you, you'll often see uh, pig pen, I guess, messages like in, in code, like codes, I guess like that. And pig pen was invented by the Freemasons. So that's another fun thing to get into too. So rot 13 is another one and rail fence is another one. There's also a huge list of categorized ciphers. This is my favorite website for um, encryption or for ciphers. And uh, if we go to it, I'll just show you really quickly what the website looks like. So it looks like this. Um, in cryptography, you've got your polyalphabetic ciphers. You've got your transposition ciphers, your substitution ciphers. There are so many of those. Uh, and then there's even subcategories of those. Like, look at all these. <laughs> it's insane. There's a lot of ciphers out there. Um, so you might be asking yourself, how on earth would I ever just look at, like, a message and know what cipher was used? Because if you, like, if, if you didn't see that this is a Caesar shift, and you, but you saw this random string of characters, you, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was encrypted, or I guess uh, ciphered using the Caesar shift, right? So there's tools that people have developed um, under the, uh, I guess the field of cryptanalysis, like uh, and, uh, tools for cipher identification. So if you click on this, you can type in any kind of cipher, hit analyze, and it'll spit out based on probabilities what the most likely cipher uh, was used for that. I don't know how on earth this works, but it's made by more brilliant minds than myself. So yeah, and I've got two, two of those right there that you can look at. Okay, so encodings. That's kind of what I was talking about before with like when you take data and you encode it into a different, I don't know what you'd call it, I guess a data format um, in order to use it for um, software purposes, right? So this is the ASCII value of some text. And then this is the binary of that same text. This is the decimal of that same text. This is the hexadecimal of that same text, and this is the base 64 of that same text. Um, if you're not already aware of it, like any plain text that you see on a computer screen is typically being encoded, right? So an ASCII encoding is human readable. UTF-8, human readable. There's also a ton of UTF variations. There's a ton of ISO variations. There's a ton of Unicode variations, but they're all plain text encoding so that humans can read the text. But then there's data that's not human readable and that's like base 64, which is this one. Decimal, which is this one. Hexadecimal, that one. And there's other kinds of non-human readable data encodings like QR codes, barcodes, and I'm sure there's a lot that I'm missing. But I'm, I just want this to help you guys kind of categorize what this knowledge belongs to. There's also hashes, which is a way to encode data, but hashes are a one-way function, meaning you can't reverse it. All of these can be reversed and translated into each other, which is really nice. Uh, but we're gonna talk about hashes once we get into password cracking, which is another really fun subject. Uh, another really important thing I wanted to mention was constructed languages. So, I, I mean, I, I haven't worked in the cybersecurity field before, so I don't really know if hackers actually use constructed languages, but a lot of the challenges that are on these websites like Try Hack Me and Hack the Box and 
uh, Cyber Skyline, they use constructed languages to encode some of these messages. And so you'll see a lot of different kinds of constructed languages. Um, usually they're constructed scripts for English. Um, but sometimes you do actually have a totally artificial language that's been created and you'll have to learn it in order to, to decrypt that message. In this case, I just have a few examples right here. Like this is Tenguar. I think it's called Tenguar. Yeah, Tenguar from uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Tolkien made that. This is, I think it's a Klingon script. Yeah, so that's Klingon from Star Trek. This is a uh, Golic Vulcan from Star Trek. Um, this is from Skyrim. You've got the dragon, <laughs> I guess it's a, the letters, and you got your Daedric letters. And then you also have this one here. I just picked it randomly because it looks crazy, but it's from uh, it's from this website, Omniglot. It's my favorite website for looking, trying to discover what kind of constructed script has been used. Uh, and this one, I have no idea how to decipher that, but there's a guide on all of these kinds of websites. So I'm just going to go to it and show you guys what it looks like to see this list of uh, constructed languages. So Omniglot, it's what I recommend, but there's other, other places you can go. It's not the only one. It's just the most concise, in my opinion. So you've got constructed scripts for like all these languages, but then you also have constructed scripts belonging to fictional alphabets. So that's the ones from like any kind of movie or video game or book that's constructed some kind of an uh, an alphabet or a syllabary for their uh, phonetic language. So for English and fictional alphabets, um, you know, you've got lots of stuff in here. And I'm sure you'll recognize some of them from the movies uh, and video games that you've played. And then you've got this one. I've never seen any challenges using this, but I suspect someday they'll do that. So there's all kinds of stuff in here. Like, I don't know. Okay, that's the other thing is I don't know how people come up with this kind of stuff. Like, it is insane. They're making, like, you know that, <laughs> if you, this might date us a little bit, but Windows XP had that pipeline screensaver. Well, someone learned how to make a language out of that. And don't ask me how, <laughs> but if you're interested, you just double check on it, read it, and it'll teach you exactly how to get the letters out of all that stuff. That blows my mind. I don't know if your minds are blown right now, but my mind is blown. Okay. So, now we're into steganography. So, I've been throwing that word around a lot. Um, usually, steganography is used in terms of hiding images inside other images or text inside other images. Um, just to show you again, this right here, they used steganography to hide the string inside that picture, right? So we go strings. They use stego to hide this inside that image. Now there's other ways to do it. Um, I want to emphasize a really tricky point about steganography, and that's the fact that like, oh, where the heck did that go? Did I close it? I don't know, it's right here again. No, that's not it. I think I closed it. Hang on, just one second. I gotta get this back up. I don't know why that happened, but... That's somewhere in there. <laughs> Whatever, man. Okay, so... Um, the, the, the thing about steganography is like, there's no one way to hide an image inside of an image. There's any way you can think of under the sun to do it. Um, there's least significant bits. So that's going through every single pixel of the image and hiding data in the unused bits in that pixel. Um, I haven't seen somebody do that yet, but I've heard a lot of people talk about discovering that in the field. Um, and then there's like... They'll, they'll find a method and they'll build a tool to automate the process so that you just drag a picture into it and then it'll, you drag another picture to hide in that picture and then it spits it out. So the big trick to steganography with images is knowing what tool to use. 
And even when you do know what tool to use, sometimes those tools implement using passwords. And so you might not, like let's say you do know the tool and you do have the image. Now you need the password and you might not even know how to do that. And so you might have to write up a script that will use that tool and automate brute forcing the password. And so who knows? The thing is, a stegon steganography is like, it's, it's tricky, man. It's really hard. And so it's even hard to begin describing how to do it. But so there's different techniques. Uh, again, like I said, images and images, text and images. You can even hide zip files and images. You can hide a movie in an image and you can flip all these around too. Like you could hide a movie inside of an image or an image inside of a movie, obviously. You could hide an audio file inside like the unused bits in a movie. Um, you could even hide text in the upper wavelengths of a sound file. And <laughs> if your mind already hasn't been blown, I hope that one does it for you. So this is called a, a spectrogram right here. Uh, it displays all the wavelengths of that, that uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's wavelength, I guess it's just frequency. So it, it shows all the frequencies inside that, that uh, audio file. And it shows, in this case, there's a bunch of random text hidden inside this image or inside this uh, sound file. And sometimes you'd be able to hear it. Like if you listen to the song, you could hear like a weird squealing and that squealing is uh, how the computer is interpreting this data as sound. Um, and then there's uh, also like hiding um, messages and I guess images and that kind of stuff inside of software. But that gets like, Discovering that stuff is where we get into exploitation, enumeration, and uh, reverse engineering software. Okay, so there's some common tools. Uh, I didn't really fill out this slide totally just because uh, at this point we'll start working on some challenges, but uh, some common tools that you could use would be uh, Steghide, which you would use to get, you can use it to both create uh, a steganography image or to extract data from a steganography image. Um, let's say it's password protected and you don't know the password. Someone nicely made a steg cracker binary that will uh, brute force the password used to make that image. There's also the digital invisible ink toolkit. Um, this was made by, or I don't know who made it actually, but it was used a lot by Cyber Skyline. Uh, Binwalk is another really useful one for just uh, simple steganography. And then Sonic Visualizer, that uh, this spectrogram image here, you can use Sonic Visualizer to uh, explore the spectrogram of different uh, audio files. Okay, so I hope that I covered all of that nicely enough. Um, I guess we'll open things up to questions now and uh, we have the challenges so Artemis very nicely uh, put together a bunch of challenges for us today I think I added one challenge to it um, but it's not in the file she's going to share with us so 